Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Fossil Friday Chats. My name is Brittany Stoneberg, the Outreach and Communications Coordinator for the Western Science Center. Joining me, as always, every week is Gabriel Santos from the ALF Museum of Paleontology. Hey, Gabe. What's up, paleo nerds? <laughs> <laughs> I feel bereft. I do not currently have a shirt from our Aww. amazing guest and artist, Ray Troll. Ray, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me, you guys. Yeah, we're How's really it, excited to have uh, you today. How is it and going it's kinda, up there in Alaska? Uh, it's uh, sideways rain today. It's a rainforest, <laughs> but uh, sorry, we're getting all of California's rain. But uh, hey, but I really like how uh, Gabe is dressed today, though. It, it is he's a very sharp looking dude today. So we, <laughs> you know, always is, but today especially. Yeah, he was on our <laughs> Paleo Nerd show a while back. So we'll have to have you, Brittany, at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. And thanks again for being on Fossil Friday Chats. And we were saying before we started that we really wish you could send the rain down here. It is very hot and dry recently in Southern California. Gosh, and it's only the beginning of summer. Yikes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> on that cheery note. <laughs> Yeah, so um, if everyone here is not familiar with Ray Troll, we'll fix that. Alaskan artist Ray Troll draws and paints natural history-inspired imagery that migrates into traveling museum exhibits, books, magazines, and, as you can obviously see, onto a popular line of t-shirts sold around the globe. Basing his offbeat art on the latest scientific discoveries, Ray brings a street-smart sensibility to the worlds of paleontology and ichthyology. <laughs> I try. So, I love fun bios <laughs> like that. It makes it fun for me. <laughs> Street smart, man. That's me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you definitely have not checked out Ray's like Instagram or his art, or if you don't own one of his amazing t-shirts yet, you definitely should. I've got quite a few in my collection by this point. <laughs> Thank you, Gabe. Appreciate that, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, as always, if you have any questions for Ray, uh, feel free to put those in the chat. We will have a Q&A session after his presentation and his talk about his work. So Ray, whenever you are ready, take it away take and time. let's go down this fossil highway. Let's do that. And let's see here. Gabe is uh, helping out of my hand. So there. deprived childhood but I also like to mention that the 60s and the 70s were good to me so this kind of informs my work you can see I'm the guy I'm not the guy with the beard there I'm the uh, I'm the uh, <laughs> this is the uh, hippie household that I lived in in Kansas and this is about 1973 I believe so very 70s oh, one moment right today. it looks like uh, your audio might not be working uh oh let's can you hear me now? Am I back? Okay, I think that is the case with my going to wear the headphones. The seventies were good to me, so there I am on that uh, on that couch. And but over the years, science has really begun. To, I've been drawing and painting my entire life. Art has been my career, and um, I began hanging out with scientists uh, a lot in the last. 30 plus years. I moved to Ketchikan 38 years ago. 
And as you were saying in the intro, a lot of people know me from my T-shirts. This is one of my most popular T-shirts, Spawn Till You Die. And uh, as you also mentioned, too, paleontology and ichthyology. I dove deep into the world of fish, and I kind of moved up here in this fish-centric fish, uh, kind of world. This is a large canvas I did for the University of Washington, Fishers of the Salish Sea. And you can see there, I kind of have my science hat on there, but um, the scale is, uh, you know, whatever interested me. So there might be really large fish that, you know, just because they look cool. But uh, in 1990, I met this guy. and We were actually a blind date, as it were, kind of put together by an editor. I wanted to do a book, and they said, I had all these pieces of artwork about fish. And they said, well, we got, I, I thought maybe some essays with the book would be kind of cool in the book. And I was teamed up with this fellow by the name of Brad Matson, a great writer, wonderful writer. We did four books together, actually. And our first book was called Shocking Fish Tales. But then... The second book, I kind of drug Brad Matson into the world of paleo since I've been obsessed with paleontology ever since I was a kid. So this is the cover of our second book, Planted Ocean, Dancing to the Fossil Record. And he's a journalist and I'm an artist, but we did this deep dive into paleo. We did a great road trip from, we started out in Southeast Alaska and then went down to British Columbia and drove all the way to Kansas and back. And it's all our, all our adventures. But there's Brad on the right in the waves there. And then uh, you can see me in the lower left there drinking a can of Copra Light beer. And these are a bunch of our uh, topics and things that we covered in that book. And here we are literally dancing to the fossil record. And there's some fossil records, Triassic Blue and Juju Jurassic, and I Want to Hold Your Lobe Fin. And this, the book, evolved into an exhibit. And uh, we went to the Burgess Shale in British Columbia. And this is my drawing of literally the Cambrian explosion. That was a pastel drawing. This is a drawing that I did, an early drawing I did of the, uh, the family tree, the tree of life. And we drove deep into the topic of evolution. It's pen and ink with some digital color in it. We had fossil adventures here in Southeast Alaska. We went trilobite hunting here in Southeast Alaska. So I was really tuning into the world of paleo all around me. This is color pencil on black paper. Uh, of course, trilobites don't get that big, but um, some of them from Canada get mm, about a foot long. But um, this is from a local island here in Southeast, some wonderful Devonian rocks. and. Brad was the editor of National Fisherman Magazine, a commercial fishing magazine. So we're into the world of fish. And as we dove deep into the topic of paleo and evolution, realizing that we are descended from bony fish and we are descended from lobe fin fish. And early on in the, uh, oh, I would say in the, in the early 90s, Eustonopteron, which is a Devonian lobe fin fish, was the candidate for being the closest to early tetrapods. So we'd like to have a little fun with it. Here's the lucky fish gets the cheeseburger. So, but as we learn more about uh, lobe fin fishes over the years, that gap between the early tetrapods and the Devonian uh, lobe fin sarcopterygian fishes has been narrower and narrower. This is a Canthostega on the top and Pandorichthys on the bottom, and now we have El Pistostege and Tiktaalik that are closer to Acanthostega. But here's Eustonopteron, it is in the lobe fin uh, fishes group. And so it's a t-shirt, so I like to hit on where we're, you know, whatever appeals to me and helps to get the message across about science and out of the use of Born to Cruise. So that's an early 90s version. If I was to do this again, this is a Lionel cut print, I'd put uh, El Pistostege there instead of Tiktaalik, since it's even closer to the tetrapods. But this is another Lionel cut. Like I said, I'm trained as a, uh, as a fine artist. I've got a couple art degrees in my back pocket, and I'd like to, to make things with my hands. So this is carved in linoleum and then watercolor on top of it the way we were. So these are the evolutionary steps. But as science changes, we learn more things about these various steps along the way. So I, I, you know, 20 years later, 30 years later, I need to kind of recalibrate some of this. 
But here's an early version of Tiktaalik. Chucky e. D says, embrace your inner fish. Neil Shubin did the great uh, book, Your Inner Fish. And uh, in the Dancing the Fossil record book, we also journeyed back to Kansas, um, where I used to live in my high school and, and undergraduate years. So I got to do these big drawings. This is pastel on uh, black mat board, actually, and of the Western Interior Seaway and all the critters there. And this is a pen and ink drawing with watercolor. And this book eventually turned into an exhibit that traveled around the nation. And it started out at the Burke Museum. And when it was at the Burke Museum, I met this fellow by the name of Kirk Johnson, who wandered into a reception that we were having at the Burke Museum with for dancing the fossil record. And he said, hey, man, we got to have that out at the Denver Museum of Natural History at some point. And eventually, in 1999, it did go out to Denver, and uh, Kirk drug me out on a uh, a great ammonite hunt. And so, as a middle-aged man, I began to be able to find fossils because I was with a paleontologist, and he knew that if I had these experiences, I'd want to paint and draw about them. And here we are projecting this at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Had a whole squadron of uh, volunteers helping out, and we changed the name of the exhibit to Cruising the Fossil Freeway at that point. And uh, volunteers helped me paint this. And uh, they're the ammonites that Kirk and I found in 1998 up near Kremlin, Colorado. And little did I know, I was actually starting a book at the time, you know, with Kirk. And then we made it formal and we, we started the book. And off I went with him. In that early book with Brad Matson, this is a drawing I did that was inspired by a poem, Trout Waiting for Dinosaurs to Go Away, that was written by Richard Brodigan, but it began to get, make me think, hmm, I wonder if there really were trout during the days of the dinosaurs. This is color pencil and white paper. And so these kind of random things happening that piqued my curiosity, and uh, I wanted to find out. I went deeper into the topic of how far back in time do salmon and trout go, and as I follow my interests, I stumbled across this creature, which ended up in the Planet Ocean book. And it's a gigantic salmon from the past. It lived during the Miocene and into the Pliocene, and Oncorhynchus rastrosus. At the time, we called it the saber-toothed salmon. And so what's cooler than having and some eight-foot-long salmon reaching about 400 pounds? What's cooler than having a saber-toothed salmon fighting with a saber-toothed uh, cat? Here's the type specimen of Oncorhynchus rastrosus from the University of Oregon. But notice that the tooth on the type specimen is missing. They found them separately, but I put a little piece of paper there to show where I thought it was. But here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, we actually did have the opportunity to have a life-size saber-toothed salmon dueling with Smilodon there, saber-toothed standoff here. And it was really cool to be able to have work with an exhibits department and just start riffing on ideas. Like I had this idea, why don't we have a trilobite table and actually have a table shaped like a trilobite? and uh, put the fossils in there. We did several tables, did an ammonite table, did a fish fossil table. They were all these, I designed the tables. This is the funnest thing that we did. And Kirk made this, help make this happen. I had this idea to change a Volvo into an Evolvo. So we have Charles Darwin driving the Evolvo and a little art car. So what I do is uh, been called scientific surrealism. So I throw in little surreal things here and there. So elements of humor, dreamlike imagery. So I'm not your typical uh, paleo artist that you might have on the show here at some point or even, anyways, my career is a, a, a strange career. This is uh, the exhibit when it rolled into the Oregon Coast Aquarium in 1996. And the crazy thing is I have another exhibit there opening June 10th this year, uh, Cruising the Fossil Coastline, the exhibit that I did uh, with Kirk. This is the exhibit that I did with Brad Matson years ago. So this is in 96, but check out all the stuff. I have an exhibit in the very same room and just painted some of the same wave patterns in there. 
This is the exhibit when it went to Philadelphia in 98, Dancing the Fossil Record. And in that exhibit, we had a lot of, you know, cool theatrical lighting and uh, painted the images big and the walls. It was up there for about almost a year. My buddy Sean Duran was the exhibits director there, and we did a lot of cool stuff. We had a big dance floor, uh, had a music soundtrack. We had a uh, lungfish in a tank back there explaining how you're related to lungfish. We had some shark fossils from uh, the Carnegie Museum on loan from Bear Gulch in Montana, and uh, including these wonderful Enopterygian fossils. Uh, ancient uh, members of the holocephalin side of the tree. And speaking of holocephalins, there's a color pencil drawing of a ratfish, chimeras. There's a male ratfish in, this, in the front there. And I'm honored to have a ratfish species named after me, Hydrolygus troli is my species. But yeah, Kirk and I did a book. Um, then we worked on it for about seven years. We started in 99 came out in about 2007 and we called it cruising the fossil freeway and kirk johnson is now at the smithsonian museum of nature and science and he was hired there in 2012 just as we we're finishing up our second book at least the travels for the second book but the first one was basically the rocky mountain states and there's uh kirk driving there's yours truly hanging out the window and all kinds of things all the paleo creatures that we encountered along the way, suburban wrecks. There we are again. There I am again. And this is, uh, Kirk actually had a dream that he told me about, uh, called, he called it, I had this dream that everything had saber teeth. And so, uh, we started riffing on this idea of saber toothed everything. So I just did this massive drawing of everything with saber teeth. And I'm also very fond of cheeseburgers. You'll see that up there in the upper left. But walruses being saber-toothed seals, at least that's how Kirk looks at them. So, and there's a the saber-toothed salmon. I did this geologic time scale for the book, which I get asked on a weekly basis if a museum or a magazine or uh, can use this, which is great. So I get those uh, that exposure that way. It's also been bootlegged a number of times, and I try to keep that under control, but uh, I'm trying to make the geologic ages fun and learnable. I've written songs uh, with my band, the Ratfish Wranglers, to help uh, kids learn their names, the geologic ages. So here's some monomics that I've come up with. Crusty old sourdoughs make perfect pancakes, toast, juice, and coffee for your Paleozoic and Mesozoic and for the Cenozoic. This one, paleontologists earn oil money, perfecting prehistoric history. As I said, I also am a musician. So being a, a creative, you never know what you're going to end up doing, but uh, it's fun to be creative. So I, I approached my band about writing a soundtrack for the Cruising the Fossil Freeway book, and we wrote a whole, whole album. It's online. You can find it on iTunes, on Spotify. And we are the Ratfish Wranglers. And uh, in that first book, I started doing these big fossil maps, the first book with Kirk. And this is a massive one that I did. It's about, the original is like five by seven feet, pen and ink on paper. And I just started plunking down fossil finds wherever they were found, basically in the area. And this is kind of the territory that Kirk and I covered in that first book, starting out in Denver. And uh, so it's spread throughout that book and everything's detailed. And we just wanted to show the incredible diversity in the fossil record and all these cool things that you can encounter along the way as you travel. And people have used this now as a kind of a road trip, um, fossil road trip. Along the way in both of the books with Brad Matson and with Kirk, I end up being obsessed by certain creatures and kind of helping out with the science on them because of my obsession and interest in them. And, Way back in the first book in 92, I ran across this fossil at the LA County Museum and wanted to figure it out because it was a shark. It was shark teeth in a big spiral. Helicoprion, and about 20 years of my life were spent on this one. And then in 2013, 
I worked with a crew from the Idaho Museum of Nature uh, of Natural History, uh, Leap Tapanilla and Jesse Pruitt and other and some of their colleagues that I helped kind of gather this group of scientists and we CT scanned uh, one of the fossils from the Idaho Museum that had all the cartilage and everything in it. But this is every wrong version ever done of Helicoprion all on one stage. Uh, pen and ink drawing with digital color by my friend Grace Freeman. This is how the, the teeth are formed in the lower jaw of Helicoprion, which is technically more of a holocephalon. It's what they call a ghost shark, not a true shark. Um, and there's the CT scan of that upper and lower jaw and the world fits in that lower jaw. And then here is the massive sculpture that my friend Gary Staub did. Uh, and I actually developed a, a traveling exhibit, uh, on the, but we later dubbed it the buzzsaw shark. And so that was a whole separate exhibit that went around the nation. And then back to Kirk, travels with Kirk. Um, we ran across some fossils of Helicoprion on that trip, but uh, on the big journeys that we took through the West, whenever there's a roadside dinosaur, you need to stop and pay respects to roadside dinosaurs. And that's why I love them, chrome domes. Got to take a break every now and then. I love this picture from our travels, the rest area. We literally ran across this out in the middle of Wyoming. Like, what's that? A chair off in a field, the rest area. I always like this one too. But Kirk did not lead a fossil deprived childhood. He was sort of the opposite of me. He was finding fossils from, you know, when he just a young kid. And then as a teenager, got tuned into paleobotany and he used to give um, these beautiful fossil flowers from Republic Washington to his uh, early girlfriends way back in the day. And being a paleobotanist, he was always, um, and continues to this day to bug me about being more plant savvy. And he always says, when you look out the window, what do you see? You see plants, you don't see a field of animals. So, you know, plants um, uh, drive his world. But I was always really about find invertebrate fossils. This is the very moment I found my first chunk of dinosaur bone. But as you guys know, the world is full of chunkosauruses, but it was a chunk of dinosaur bone. And in our first trip through the, one of our first journeys through uh, the West, we went to North Dakota and at this site near Marmoth, North Dakota, Kirk got super excited that day, and there was this mysterious layer that he found. It turns out that actually that is the iridium later layer. That is the the KT boundary right there uh, in North Dakota. It's the first time that it had actually been found in North Dakota, and um, this is not too far from that uh, the more famous site now. The uh, uh, nearby site that really has maybe the day that uh, the dinosaurs died, but uh, that's the KT boundary in North Dakota. And Kirk ended up doing a paper on that. But I was amazed at this guy's talent. This paleontologist, a bona fide paleontologist that I got to travel the West with. And uh, so I had a one-on-one -on -one education with one of the world's best scientists. And Kirk is, like I said, now at the Smithsonian. But we'd be casually driving along, and Kirk would say, look, I think there's dinosaur footprints right over here. And lo and behold, as we were cruising along, we, he said, I think there's some footprints in this formation. We pulled over in this road cut in South Dakota, stepped out of the truck, and here's the road cut. He said, I think there's going to be tracks along this. I can see these little divots. We stepped over the guardrail, flipped over the very first rock, and there was this massive footprint of a very large crocodile from the Cretaceous. And uh, finger, you can see the toenails and everything there, the claws. And uh, that ended up being a paper that Kirk wrote, the first vertebrate uh, fossil footprints found in that formation. And this is how those footprints are formed. And Kirk is so good at finding footprints that even when he was in China, it was on the Amur River between China and Russia, 
he spotted footprints from uh, the boat. And uh, years later, we went back to China, and lo and behold, they had actually erected a bronze statue of Kirk Johnson. So there he is. He doesn't show this often. But there he is with his, his statue in China. Life, actually, slightly larger than life statue of Kirk Johnson, finding dinosaur footprints. But along the way, we coined this term paleo nerd syndrome, and I'm doing a podcast now with a ventriloquist buddy of mine, David Strassman. We're doing, like I said, a weekly thing, the wistful loneliness of the geologically inclined. Dream of the double ditty, acrylic painting. Hell pigs, archaeotherium. Hell pig, archaeotherium. We just had uh, Scott Foss talking in Tila Dance on the podcast uh, that'll be in season three of the podcast. Stylinodon, another animal, a ta early Tyenodont uh, from the uh, Paleocene, Eocene age, weird prehistoric mammals. You gotta love your trilobites, the trilobite subculture. My first tattoo is a flaming trilobite. This is the second book I've done with Kirk and this exhibit is now traveling down the West Coast. It's been at several museums started out at the Anchorage Museum, and they traveled that exhibit. It's about to open at the Oregon Coast Aquarium, and this is the cover of that book. And there's our heroes in the forecastle. And I did another geologic time scale, now focused on the beach and the fossils that you can find along the beach. So this is pen and ink with digital color. And the thing is, we can output these to wall size, so it's a... It's, um, been cool to kind of switch to some of the, the uh, digital stuff. So I do original pen and ink, uh, pencil drawing first, then pen and ink. And then uh, if I'm too lazy to color it or if I want to uh, reach out to one of my uh, friends, I uh, work with Grace Freeman, who does a lot of the digital coloring for me. And Grace did the coloring on this. Um, but this is my pen and ink, the scientist and the artist. And as Kirk and I worked in the second book, we became obsessed, mutually obsessed. And I think Gabe Santos shares this obsession. And that's what led me to meeting Gabe is our love of Desmostylians, these ancient marine mammals, this order of marine mammals that went extinct and flourished only in the North Pacific. Um, and cool, cool creatures and mysterious creatures. So I follow these obsessions and these interests and I'm lucky enough to follow my interests and you know make art and make a living doing this. And I like to dive into some of these scientific debates and just try to show them. These are all these different ideas about how Desmostylians even managed to move around, stand up on land. We know they're marine mammals that lived along the coast, but their bones fit together in such a strange fashion that there's been a lot of debate as to how they got around. And the Japanese have their ideas, and it's fun to watch these debates go back and forth and our understanding of animals go back and forth. And as we learn more, and if they were only around these days, we could go surfing with the Desmos. There's a Megalodon chewing on a Desmo. And it's pretty exciting to see that there was a Desmostylian that was described in 2015 by uh, a group of scientists that was actually discovered in Alaska, in Alaska Stylus tomidae, and uh, Lou Jacobs and colleagues described this animal. And it's a massive uh, desmo from uh, near Dutch Harbor, Alaska. This color pencil drawing I did of that particular beast, and they found juveniles along with some adults there, so they were in groups. This is my wife, Michelle, who's maybe a little perturbed by my obsession with <laughs> paleo paradoxia doxies i call them as well but there's kirk with a life-size sculpture done by my friend gary staub of unalaska stylus tomaday and um this is at the anchors museum and like i said this uh life-size sculpture that you, you can stick your head inside of is down in uh newport oregon and that exhibit opens uh, uh, June 10th. I like to draw these evolutionary trees showing the relationships and work with scientists. So this is some of the latest thinking. It's still a little bit of controversy as to what Desmos are really more closely related to, but 
some of the latest thinking has them closer to tapers and uh, horses and calicatheers, although there are still people that think they are more closely related to elephants, which is fascinating. Which brings me to, you know, some of my art, I like to draw these evolutionary trees. I've done a survey of people and asked them, what do you think bears are most closely related to? An informal survey that we did uh, actually here in my gallery in Ketchikan, and we just asked people, what do you think bears are related to? What are the, what are the closest relatives? And it's surprising to see that only 3% of the average person he has, even has a clue that the pinnipeds, the seals, sea lions, and walruses are closest to the bears. And so I like to do these evolutionary trees that show those relationships. So it's kind of a mind blowing thing, you know, and the fact that like we're descended from fish and then there's creatures like the saber tooth salmon. And then this, and then the science changes on that. Those are the vertebrae from uh, Oncorhynchus rastrosus, the saber tooth. But then, and they got to be eight feet long and maybe even more than that, 400 pounds. I had a lot of fun with that. Did a big mural with my friend Memo Haragi, and Gary did a uh, life-size sculpture of one uh, in Eugene, Oregon, at the Natural History Museum there on campus, at the University of Oregon campus. But then, lo and behold, some recent discoveries show that those uh, sabers really are sideways pointing, and all these uh, recent skulls that have been found, every single one of them, it's not just a a matter of preservation, all the the sabers point sideways. So it's more like a spike, which is pretty mind blowing. So get out the pen and ink, get out the pencil and the eraser, start over again. And let's call it something else because it's really not saber like, you know? And so I start throwing these common names out and hoping that they'll stick because that's how a common name really becomes common usage. So, um, I'm nominating that we call it uh, the spike tooth salmon, the giant spike tooth salmon. And here is uh, another sculpture done by Gary Staub that's in the uh, uh, fossil coastline show, Pachyrhinosaurus. Here's the world's only trilobite couch. Here's a map I did of Alaska and the Yukon. I've got a nice one of California as well. And I'll wrap up my little talk here uh, with a lifelong dream of mine going hunting for dinosaurs actually in Alaska in the north slope of Alaska. If you look at the map, the fossil map of Alaska, dinosaurs have been found, beautiful dinosaur uh, bones have been found in the bone bed, uh, Cretaceous bone bed along the Colville River up north, in the very far north of Alaska. And just before Kirk took the job at the Smithsonian, this is a uh, our dig site along the Colville River. And uh, we were up there for a week with Greg Erickson and actually uh, expedition led by Pat Druckenmiller from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And uh, spent a week up there digging. And this is Happy Kirk Johnson in his digging hole right next to mine. Very neatly dug out and he's excavated uh, duckbill dinosaur uh, tailbones, basically one after the other and very methodically laid them all out. And there I am in the hole next to him. You can see we're up on a slope above the Colville River. And I'm chipping away at the old mud banks. And on that day, I found this Nanuxaurus tooth. So at the age of, I was 58 years old then, and I, I pretty much burst into tears. Well, I didn't burst into tears. I, I I got a tear, I got teary eyed because it was a lifelong dream to find like, you know, not only, you know, cool dinosaur bones, but to find a tooth of a, a giant predatory Tyrannosaur, Nanuxaurus. It's, it's broken tooth, but it's right there with all the other uh, duckbill bones and pretty rare. So I was pretty excited, but it was just very cool to, to find that. And sort of the last piece of, art that I did for the Cruise in the Fossil Coastline book is I did another evolutionary tree, much more detailed, and worked with a bunch of biologists from the Stanford uh, University to get these, these branches in the tree correct, and tuned way into that pen and ink. Grace did the, uh, the digital coloring on this, 
and following you know history of life on our planet where it branches and you know we are really part of the big bony fish branch the vertebrates and tuning into it also i would dig deeper into the literature and i was wondering about what is the sister group to primates i began to read up on papers is it bats and then i came across these papers that no the sister group to primates are the colugos which was like what the heck is a colugo and they are they called flying lemurs but they're not lemurs so this sister group to uh primates and so i was very happy to put the colugo branch next to the primates right up there and i thought that was that's another obscure animal people know little about but uh, now i'm tuned into colugos and with that look under your feet the past is there and uh i've had a lifelong adventure doing all that stuff paleo nerds season three we're going to start dropping episodes i think uh here on june 23rd so we drop them on wednesday so we got a whole bunch of episodes coming up I do this with my buddy David Strassman and my daughter Karina is our social media manager. So we're on Instagram as well and Facebook and Twitter. And with that, if you want to know more about what I do, uh, there's my website. Google my name, you'll find Troll Art. And with that, I think I will exit. <laughs> that was a rambling ride through the world of Troll. That was great. Thank you, Ray. Um, you should have seen the face I made when you posted the Kaluga. I just, I made small Can grabby hands. It was so cute. Small grabby hands. <laughs> so how do I stop sharing this or Gabe, yeah, could you control that? Uh, you just uh, go down to the bottom and you can end the share from the three little buttons over there. Go down to the bottom. Do, 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 do. Oh, wait, no, on the call. All the three little buttons. There you go. Stop sharing. Boom. There you go. There you go. Yeah, oh, thank you, Ray. Um, yeah. One question I had, because um, you talked about how, you know, you're not your, uh, as you said, not your typical paleo artist. No. So much of, so much, well, and I think that's an awesome thing, because like I said, I think a lot of paleo art kind of focuses specifically on reconstruction, where you kind of come from a fine art background. Yes, could I you kind of, yeah. could you kind of talk about that, your approach to paleo art, when it's not just trying to make, even like, you know, make a one-to-one -one reconstruction, really trying to bring an artistic, per creative perspective to paleo art? Well, I guess, well, thanks. Uh, that's a great question. I am, I'm trying to get it trying to make it art, you know, I guess <laughs> art, art, because um, there's art and then there's art, art, because I'm, you know, I went to uh, my undergraduate degrees in studio arts, and then I got a master of fine arts in, in art, in studio art, in printmaking and drawing. And so I like to try to make compelling images and uh, images that could be well considered art, you know, so it's always and that's an elusive category, right? So it's not so easily defined. What is art? So, uh, <laughs> um, but I, I'm trying to make an image that is engaging in some way, that's striking, that uh, you may walk by and, oh, well, what does that mean? What is that? It's intriguing. Sometimes I really think the best art to me is open to interpretation, is maybe thought provoking, and is not so clearly defined. It's mysterious, has an edge of mystery to it. So you want to step closer. What is this about? And maybe, you know, you're bringing your own meaning to it as well. But that said, the paleo nerd in me wants to get the animals correct. I enjoy making them as correct as I can because I'm really interested in, in the reality of it. And that's why, you know, as a kid, um, you know, dragons are cool and fun, but they're not real. You know, and uh, and Star Wars. No, I'm sorry. You know, Gabe. Star Wars is cool. <laughs> but it's not real, man. <laughs> it's based on, but but there's science behind. Not to say there isn't science behind Star Wars, but um, but it's that thing. Uh, um, 
the uh, the search for getting the, the creatures right, but also trying to deliver a message with it. So I want you to think, where do we, you know, maybe stop you in your tracks. Where do we come from? You're descended from fish, or did you know that sea lions are really sea bears? Or did you know that, do you know about Kalugos? Nobody knows about, Kal do you know about Kalugos? Check them out. It's no, the sister group to primates, which makes you just think about yourself a little bit differently or look at a clue and go, hmm, that's my cousin. <laughs> so <laughs> I I really appreciate like that kind of ideology, I guess. It's it's because it's like you can find your art, Ray. I, I would easily be able to see yours in an art museum and a natural history museum. It's something that folks can enjoy without the science, but it also allows guess, them to yeah, think yeah. greater beyond the art and ask questions and broaden those perspectives. And it's it's in that really beautiful middle ground of both art and science. You know, like the Venn diagram for yours is just one <laughs> circle of art and science. And I, I, I think that's one of the a Amen. great way to get folks to really, really start to ask questions about science because, you know, they see something with like really you know a, this beautiful piece of art that may not they may not understand is something scientifically inspired um in the first place and once they get that into their brain that piece of art on their in their brain will start to get them to like what is that how real is that where did that come from it's one of those things that i don't think a lot of folks can get in a lot of other paleo art where it's more in the natural history realm well you know I yeah, that's a good point. It's, uh, and I, I think really a pivotal point in my career was after I'd done the Planet Ocean book, Dancing to the Fossil Record with Brad, I had 70 pieces of art and I was framing them up and I was going to put them in a gallery show or, you know, I was thinking about what do I do with all this stuff? You know, <laughs> I've got all these, you know, the saber tooth salmon images and, you know, d you know people dancing and, and uh, a friend, I went to a friend who's an arts advisor, and I said, well, should I go to a gallery? Should I just show these in my own space? Or, and she said, well, why don't you go approach a natural history museum? And she recommended I go to the Burke Museum in Seattle. And I walked in, and I proposed that I have basically an art show in a natural history museum. Mm -hmm. But that I had to prove that the art was based on science, and the scientists had to review it. And they said, well, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. And they let me paint on the walls. The next thing I know, I'm, I painted all over the walls. But it was it, it, it resonated with people. So people kind of got it. So I literally kind of crossed that barrier. And that's where the fun is. I think when you mix the disciplines, you know, when you cross over, that's where uh, it's really pretty exciting, you know. You, you feel like you're breaking Absolutely. new territory. Yeah. You know? All right. We've got some great questions from the chats. So we'll go through as many as we can. Um, this first one is from Matthew. Uh, wondering what your favorite uh, prehistoric water creature currently is. Oh, and also from uh, Matthew. Living or extinct? Uh, ooh. Well, he said prehistoric, so I think extinct. And he's also wondering where your favorite like place you've dug up fossils is. Uh, my favorite prehistoric aquatic animal? Oh, well, it's got to be Helicoprion. Uh, mm -hmm. I devoted 20 years of my life to understanding that animal and the buzzsaw shark is what we dubbed it. And I'm glad to hear that if you Google buzzsaw shark, that's what comes up now. Uh, in my obsession, I, I literally feel like I drug that out of the back rooms and into the limelight. And, you know, 15 years ago, if you'd Googled it, you wouldn't see anything. But now it's I had to learn to let it go, too, because now it's out there in the world. <laughs> and actually, if I was to draw it again as I go deeper into the science, beginning to think maybe it had one gill slit, which is a big deal to me, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, rethinking that. But anyways, it would be helicoprine, the buzzsaw shark. Mm -hmm. What, what was up with that crazy spiral of teeth? And, uh, my living, uh, fish would be of course the rat fish, which, you know, is on my arm <laughs> there. Nice. Rat fish. <laughs> Awesome. And then oh, where and, would your, uh, oh, oh, yeah, your favorite I, or, fossil place to dig in? Well, the Colville River was, was just astounding. 
uh, to be to actually go to a bone bed and oh my god, you, there's a reason they call them a bone bed. There's just so many bones, it's insane. As you're walking along that river uh, and you see the layer, and then you start recognizing what the bone looks like, you begin to realize, wow, there's just a lot of animals died here, and there's more and more. It's And it's an incredible landscape because there's not a tree to be seen, and the Arctic light uh, is almost indescribable, that, uh, you know, eternal twilight, and, um, you know, is it in the fall? But also in the chalk rock in Kansas is pretty amazing. Um, and my I have good friends, another hybrid person is, uh, my friend, uh, Chuck Bonner, he and his wife, Barb run kind of a parallel gallery to, uh, our gallery that we have here in Ketchikan. And Chuck is trained as an artist as well, but he and his wife have a, um, fossil slash museum store right in the middle of uh, the chalk rock country. And I go, um, they have permission from all the landowners there and it's fun to go fossil hunting with them and finding, you know, Cretaceous fish, going Cretaceous yeah. fish, paleo fishing. <laughs> uh, this is a good question from our uh, friend Lucas. How long did it take you to finish the tree of life? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. I'd say it was about a two, easily a two month project, at least maybe three months. There was the figuring out the tree, which was mm -hmm. a few weeks of going back and forth and debating with the scientists, the Stanford scientists that were working with me and they weren't paleontologists. So I had to reach out to a few paleontologists as well. But then, uh, Penciling it out, it's, the original is 22 by 30 inches. So I just get these big pieces of paper and I did it in pencil first, did a few sketches, then I did it in pencil. And then once I scanned that pencil drawing to see if everybody was cool with it, then I inked it. And then I worked with Grace and the coloring of it. And uh, yeah, so the original was uh, actually done in honor of uh, uh, Chuck Baxter, who's one of the helped me uh, found the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium, and Chuck turned 90 a couple of years back, and uh, some friends had gotten together, and they commissioned that Tree of Life for Chuck's 90th birthday. So it was cool to go down to the Monterey Bay Aquarium where they celebrated his birthday, and we presented the original to Chuck. Oh, but, that's cool. But actually, having since read some of the latest thinking on evolution and um, uh, the tangled tree, the tangled bank is, um, oh, I'm at Blanky and the authors, uh, David Quammen's latest book. Uh, there's a lot of new thinking with evolution, and the tree is not as simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you get the truth. Yeah, way back, you know, there's a lot of uh, horizontal gene transfer. So we have to start thinking of it not only as a tree, but maybe more of a vine that mm -hmm. kind of does this thing. And that makes my head spin. But... <laughs> That's science for you. Every time yeah. we find something new, the story changes. Never not so same. simple. When, um, um, when, I'll go, go what for is like, Sorry. when you like, it's a, it, um, like for your tree of life or like your geologic time scale, you know, like, you see those all the time on the internet, you know, teachers love to use your geologic time scales in their classroom. What, what cause, what, what's your, like your main source of inspiration to come up with like these really beautiful illustrations? Is it, is it seeing something or is it hearing a new science fact that makes you want to like visualize it? What, what really inspires you to create some of your like more, more educational quote pieces? Well, just being wanting to draw something that you could look at and understand quickly. And uh, I just, it was just so natural for me, you know, Kirk, I realized actually with, with the book with Kirk is like, you know, we need a geologic time scale for this book. And, you know, I brought it up and Kirk said, yeah, we really do. We should do that. And so he was my scientific team just to make sure all my dates were correct on it. But uh, it was just a natural thing for me to make it, fun <laughs> so rather than just a chart 
why not put the little fossils and little creatures kind of there and maybe something fun to look at? You know, there's people, you know, so there's the truck in the top and they're pointing down and, and it's Kirk and I up there and our, the mythical dog that we never had that's up there with <laughs> us pointing. I'm pointing at a ter uh, pteranodon. But I just put the fossils in there too and, and gave it some color and made it kind of fun. And now if they're not using that time scale, I've seen it cloned, uncomfortably cloned, but whatever. It's out there in the world now. So I try to make it fun, but I got to say a huge influence on my life too uh, was growing up with Mad Magazine. <laughs> yes. And then getting into art history too, you know, but uh, as I grew older, but Mad Magazine and all the crazy complicated drawings in there and stuff they'd hide in the drawings. I love that busyness. I love detail. I hide cheeseburgers in pretty much all my art just because <laughs> I like to hide stuff in there. Uh, we had William Stout on recently, and William Stout hides stuff in his oh, stuff yeah. too all the time, you know, in all of his murals. He's got stuff in there just to amuse yourself, but also the the more sophisticated viewer will start looking for those things, you know. So, so now y'all know you I'm gotta go looking gonna... for cheeseburgers. For cheeseburgers. I'm definitely gonna look for cheeseburgers. Are there oh, any on there? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> um, I, in the exhibit in uh, Oregon, we painted a bunch in the on the wall. So there's like a dozen cheeseburgers in the show, and three ratfish. No, five ratfish in the show. So. <laughs> um, this question is from uh, Shadaka. How do you decide the colors of the species that you draw? I try to look at modern day analogs. So pretty easy to you know think of uh but then you know you can think of a giant sauropod uh a, you know uh diplodocus and a modern day analog there are none really mm -hmm. other than you think elephant and elephants are just gray but then you think wait a minute they're reptiles they must have had maybe some sort of markings but wait a minute some of the larger animals have like a giraffe has this crazy sort of, uh, you know, camo on it. So, but, but in the in the natural world, there's all kinds of of uh, analogs that you can look at. So if there's, you know, a shark, you can look at modern day sharks. If it's a ratfish, you can look at modern day ratfish. But then you can also think about the ancient environments. And but as you guys know too, some of the uh, pigments are. You know, scientists are beginning to parse out some of the pigment patterns and some of the the uh, actual chemical signature of pigments. So we are able to kind of maybe figure out what some of these incredible Jurassic, you know, raptors, uh, feathered raptors, the patterns on them. They've even discerned uh, ichthyosaur color and a mosasaur color. They came up with black, though, for ichthyosaurs, and it's like, I don't know. It seems a little dull to me. It was one <laughs> genus, so. Um, but yeah, basically am animals are camouflaged or maybe they're also to blend in their backgrounds, but also, as we know too, there also are sometimes warnings or sometimes they are used to attract a mate. So they might be outrageously colored. So hmm. you get a whole gamut. And then sometimes I just get a little crazy and because I'm a scientific <laughs> surrealist, I can... I could do a purple bus shark. Yeah. 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 Ah, scientific right. surrealism is probably going to become my new favorite genre of art <laughs> after Vincent van Gogh. So I think, I think we're <laughs> good with this one. There's impression is <laughs> scientific surrealism. Yeah. <laughs> um, this might be a good uh, final question from the chat. Uh, I think it'll be a good one to close on. This is again from Matthew. What advice would you give to paleo artists on approaching a museum or gallery? Was it more about who you know or building up relationships with scientists and others? Maybe a combination of those type of things. You know, I think it's, uh, when I was a younger person, I used to really think, oh, you know, I was disgruntled or I would be bitter that, oh, they knew someone, that's how they got in. Well, you know what, as you get older, you do know people. <laughs> and if you know them, they understand you maybe a bit, you know, and there's a lot of internet noise out there in the world. So if you have a personal connection, but I, I have gotten a lot of my scientific credibility as it were, basically from people I know and people I interact with and become friends with, you know? So 
it doesn't help. I mean, it doesn't hurt to have a friend. But also, if you know you're, you know, you've got to be bold enough to make that scary phone call. You have to have the confidence in yourself to do that. So uh, I don't think of it as shameless self-promotion. You know, when you uh, stick your foot in the door, you have to have courage to get up and make a presentation to a, an audience or to sing that song or to recite that poem. You need to be bold and assertive. Um, but, you know, know your stuff. Make sure your work is good. Uh, that you believe in your work and um, uh, make sure your science is right. And, you know, people will, people are going to judge you, you know, you make that phone call and they're going to make a judgment call on you. And it's, you find out in the world too, not everybody likes you. And there's a big committee. And in that committee, maybe two of the people are really not for you and the rest, you know, you begin to realize institutions are many headed beasts with many different missions <laughs> within that. You know, and so you have to kind of resonate with as many of them as you can. You can have an audience. So know your audience, you know. And likewise, on uh, Fossil Forum or <laughs> know when uh, know when you've said enough <laughs> with the wrap up question. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, just want to say thank you so much, Ray, for joining us. Uh, on the show today it's been really fun I, I i was you know i'm a huge fan i love seeing your art and it was really great to kind of learn your story a bit too and for those of you watching at home please make sure you check out the paleo nerds podcast not just because i'm in one episode but you can definitely check that out <laughs> if you like um but it's also you, really great a lot of people really love your episode too because you bring the enthusiasm and the fun they can feel that and Brittany, you're you, i've got your number so watch out <laughs> Finish up that master's and then we'll we'll come find you. But uh, no, thanks. It's been a real honor being here with you guys and uh, more power to you. You're making science fun and accessible. And, um, you know, knowledge is power and, um, you know, truth is power. So truth. So. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I think that does it for today's episode. Thank you so much to everybody for tuning in. As always, if you like this program and want to support programs like it at the Alf Museum and Western Science Center, you can find links on how to support our museum in the description below. Um, check out Paleo Nerds Podcast. All the links um, to Ray's book and his website are in the description as well. And make sure you like and subscribe to our channel for more stories from the world of paleontology. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. See you.